Well, good evening again, beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as is typical with the way that we introduce these subjects, <clears throat> I do think it's important for the person presenting the study to recite the responsibility. Yahweh declares through his prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23 and 28, him that speaketh the word, let him speak it faithfully. And I think that is very much, along with the other scriptures that we've quoted from time to time, our responsibility this evening. The subject matter that we're dealing with is a continuation of the study of God manifestation. And as the statement is at the top of your front screen, with the picture there of the tabernacle on the outer court, is that very, various portions of history, as we've already gone through in our introductory studies, emphasize the many specific doctrines of the kingdom of God and the tabernacle. It's a little bit different than Joseph, maybe the life of Abraham, maybe Esther. It teaches the vital doctrine of God manifestation. And we pointed out last week, um, I believe it was the week before rather, um, that God willing, at least we pointed out that the tabernacle and the temple, there are no more detail given to any particular subject in scripture than the tabernacle and the temple in scripture, because it teaches this vital doctrine. Of all the many parables, this is the one that teaches the doctrine of God manifestation. But in saying that, and I believe we said this last time, and one, we want to reiterate it, although it's detailed, it is very deliberately fundamental and not difficult to comprehend. Whether we're talking about the altar or the pillars or the labor or the, the ark, they're not difficult to define. The, the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, spends a lot of time defining those. And it doesn't make any difference what portion of the parables, those spoken by Christ, those that appear in the history of Israel, they contain spiritual principles. And they are foremost about the details and the specific details of the kingdom of God and its different phases of existence. We know that it existed in the past. It will exist again in the future. And there is a joining of people to it now. And Christ himself, as John 1 said, that he was the word made flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have a host of scriptures, especially in the gospel recorded in John, where he talks about all the words that I speak, all the works that I do. They are the father's. They are not mine. I came to do the will of the father and not mine. That man individually was the epitome of God manifestation. He was the manifestation of the deity himself, his express image, as Hebrew says, embodied in the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that he did was the imprint of the father. And therefore he is the nucleus, <clears throat> whether he be the altar, he's called that. Whether he be the ark, the mercy seat, he's called that, the propitiation. Any aspect of this element of the tabernacle is first and foremost fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the things that we're going to talk about are not difficult to at least find their fundamental application. When we read this regarding Exodus 25, that they would make an ark of shittim wood, <clears throat> we note there that the statement is, following the introduction of how the children of Israel were to make it according to his pattern so that God could dwell among them. And we saw from the New Testament references, not hard to track down at all. The whole purpose of the tabernacle was God manifestation. It was the glorification of God in and among his people. And you know that the apostle changes that language from among to in his people. And we find this note that they shall make the commandments given to Moses begins with the most holy because the truth begins with Yahweh. Everything in scripture is from the divine point of view. And in the law of Moses, Brother Roberts points out, and we'll quote here in red, thou shalt make series begins with the ark, the mercy seat, and the cherubim. And then the did make series begins with the curtains, the boards, and the bars, and the outer portion in brief one begins with the inside. It's given as a pattern from the divine point of view. And then the actual building of it is from the outside. Because we know that ultimately the most holy, and we'll prove it in time, represents immortality. Christ himself 
entered into the most holy heaven itself, its immortality, which he says is the harmony of the facts in the historic evolution. Inside matters come last in the actual realization, though they come first in the promise. And we know that the metals were pure the more that we got into the most holy. So as suggested by Brother Roberts, we'll start our consideration with the outer court because we are talking about the principles of God manifestation here. As our brother read for us in Exodus 27, that we begin this series of the thou shall make, that there was a south side, the hangings were fine twine linen, and there were to be 20 pillars and 20 sockets. And then the north side corresponding to it was to be of 20 pillars with 20 sockets. So you have the north and the south side with their 20 pillars and that they were to be set in sockets of brass. Now, this is what Brother Mansfield says in the expositor. And we've hopefully broken down all of these many works that we have today to get the generalized epitome of all these principles. He says that the wall of white linen that separated the sanctuary or the tent of Yahweh from the tents of the Israelites, we know from numbers they encamped round about the tabernacle, was teaching that flesh profits nothing. The court is primarily a barrier. And this was a barrier, brothers and sisters, to common Israelites from their common day and walk of life. It prevented unlawful approach and so protected the worship of Yahweh against defilement. From whom? Defilement from us, brothers and sisters, those that had been called out, baptized in the Red Sea. It represents a clear line of demarcation, emphasizing the separateness, which is an essential feature of acceptable worship. It makes clear the way of approach teaching Israelites to realize that Yahweh dict dictates the terms of worship. We emphasize that in our first class. Everyone that gives it willingly, Exodus 25, first nine verses. But Yahweh says, he shall take from among them gold, silver, brass, fine linen, jewels as those specified. And they will make it according to my pattern. It doesn't mean that we're able to offer whatever we want just because we offer it willingly. And that was covered at length in the first class. So here we have the fine twine linen. That's what the wall was. The wall wasn't gray, somewhere between the darkness of the flesh and the righteousness of Yahweh. Yahweh sets his standards very, very clear. It's defined in the apocalypse. You'll know this. It's in the Bible dictionary as the righteousness of the saints. It's clean and white. It's further defined in the apocalypse as those that have made their garments white in the blood of the lamb. That is that they have associated with him by the principle of sacrifice, something we'll get to. And then those that are rewarded, they will walk with him in white, clothed in white raiment, being worthy in the Apocalypse chapter 3. Again, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, gives a lot of definitions for the aspects of the tabernacle. There is a reason for that. Remember, it teaches God manifestation. The principles laid out in the very beginning of the Mosaic are ultimately going to be fulfilled. Revelation 20, 21, when the tabernacle has come down the New Jerusalem, and it dwells in and among men. And so that we see with the angels that they were in white linen when Christ was buried. He, of course, was buried in fine linen garments representing his character. And here's another aspect of the elements of type. Taken from the prison, Joseph, representing the resurrected Christ, changes his prison garments to fine linen. Mordecai the same. He was going to be hanged upon a tree, He's clothed with a garment of fine linen in the presence of the king. So you can see where the principles involved here just continue to build in other aspects of these prophetic parables. This is where the standard of God manifestation begins. If we think that Yahweh is somewhat like us, we are wrong. His standard begins with righteousness, clean and pure and undefiled. He's of too pure of eyes to even to behold sin. He can only deal with us through a mediator. 
So that's where our understanding of God manifestation begins. And he makes no apologies for that, brothers and sisters. It is righteousness. And it is righteousness, as I learned many years ago, very rightly, from Uncle Colin Hollenby. If you note the quote at the bottom of your screen, we do not receive a crown for being righteous. Because the word declares over and over again that there is none righteous, not one. We've all gone out of the way, Jew and Gentile, as Romans 3 says, we've all manifested what we are. We're serpents, we're adders, vipers, poison under our tongue. If we are found faithful, we can have faith imputed for righteousness, like with Abraham. And we can receive a crown of righteousness, but we are not righteous. We can receive a garment, a clothing of righteousness, but we are not righteous. We know what we are, brothers and sisters. We are hoping that we can never, in the, in the principles of the truth, we can never get to the point where we declare one small piece of our own righteousness. If there is anything built, it is built by Yahweh, which is why it had to be fashioned according to his pattern. He is going to build it. So if there's anything meet for the master's use in the end, it is according to his pattern that he has built. And in this, we find these pillars, this principle of righteousness that we do not have of ourselves, but only hope that faith can be imputed for it, that we can receive a crown of righteousness. There were pillars holding it up. And all throughout the word, and you know this, that the saints in the various aspects are described as pillars, such as James and Peter and John, such as he that overcomes will be made a pillar in the temple of God. Even Solomon, in a figurative, the two Jew and Gentile aspects of which humanity will make up the kingdom of God and the manifestation of the deity in the age to come, he sets pillars in the porch, the permanent fixture of the tabernacle, and he gives them proper names. One is a Jake and the other one is Boaz. And he calls them pillars set in the porch. So we understand that a pillar represents a saint. And a pillar is useless in and of itself, except it be for the purpose of holding up the pure white linen righteousness of Yahweh. And that is our duty, brothers and sisters. And we even know the hints the word gives to referring to the ecclesia that way. We are not about holding up our own righteousness. Not at all. We're never about upholding our own integrity. And there may be many cases where someone who we don't even think we get on well with in the truth delivers a principle of truth where we have to receive it humbly, knowing that the righteousness of Yahweh has been declared. That's all we care about is the reputation of Almighty God. We read this concerning Jeremiah. Speak unto them all that I command me. Do not be dismayed at their faces. Don't be confounded by them. I've set thee as a defense city, as an iron pillar, as brazen walls against them. They will not prevail against thee. So Jeremiah himself was set as a pillar. A pillar is a strong erect material to hold up the principles of God as Yahweh told Jeremiah here. Just speak my word faithfully, they will, they will resist thee. But give no thought for it. They will not prevail against the principles of God. And that's where the ecclesia has to stand, brothers and sisters, as the pillar and ground of the truth. It is the house of God. It is not for our own integrity. It is an ecclesia of the living God. And we have to know how to behave ourselves in that. It is not about our name or our renown in the earth. Scripturally defined principle of the pillar is the setting up of the mark of separation. It is, by the way, the same word that appears in Exodus 14. And this is important because remember what Brother Robert said and what Brother H.B. Mansfield said about why that white linen was established. It was a line of demarcation to separate between the righteousness of Yahweh and the camps of Israel as a whole. Well, look where this same word appears when the children of Israel come up out of the land of Egypt. 
there would be a pillar, same word, as a cloud that would go before their faces. And the purpose for that is to stand between the camp of the Egyptians and the Israelites so that it would be darkness unto Egypt and it would be light to the Israelites. That is the purpose of a pillar. And it's very, very important in the integrity of this principle, brothers and sisters, that they were set in sockets or feet of brass. Because we already denoted in the first class the principles of gold, silver, and brass. And brass is flesh purified. It's the purifying of the nature. It is very important for us to understand what we are. And we are at our core, a pillar set in brass to hold up the integrity of someone else. To emphasize the crucifixion of Christ in John 3, he draws out a principle from Numbers 21 that a brazen serpent would be put upon a pole, typifying he shared our nature and the purifying of the flesh, a partaker of flesh and blood. So it's very important these pillars know what their duty is. It is to uphold the integrity of Yahweh alone. They recognize that they're set in sockets of brass, but they still have a duty to do. And it is no different than what we've already enumerated and what Brother Roberts and H.P. Mansfield say. The pillars were of shittim wood. Wood is a symbol of human nature. Cut down and fashioned for Yahweh's use. There's a very specific reason, brothers and sisters, that it says more than once, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on a tree. He bare our sin in his body. That's where he bare it, on the tree. That we, being dead to sin, should live now unto righteousness. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not that there was anything wrong with the law. It was holy and just and good, but it was weak because of the flesh. And being made a curse for us, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. The tree is the nature of man, humbled and hewn down and put to death, and now used for the master's purpose. You get that in Solomon's temple. What happened? The great cedars of Lebanon hew them down, it says, in the timbers of the fir, bring them down from Lebanon, bring them down, hew them down, put them into the sea as a typical baptism, then convey them down the sea in floats and place them in the place that shall be appointed. It's the humbling of flesh, put into the waters of baptism, identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ to be used for the work at hand. And notice the numerics involved, because our brother actually read for us in verses 9 through the end of the chapter here. When you find, and you can mark it there in your margin, you'll find that you have 60 total. By the door of the gate, of course, you have four. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Christ is the door. He's identified as the door. But in total, you have 20 on one side, the north and the south, equaling 40. You have 10 on the west, equaling 50. Six on the east, and then those four that made up the actual gate of the door, which equals 60. And that's exactly the number of the valiant men from Saul and from David's army, the mighty men that were appointed by David to reign and strengthen themselves in his kingdom. It is used in the Song of Solomon, that is. The 60 pillars, and you'll know, again, I'll just say quickly, they correspond to uh, David's mighty man and, of course, the ones spoken of in the Song of Solomon, the valiant men, three score men for war. So it's significant that those pillars are numerically equivalent to the valiant men in Israel. The fillets of silver. These were rods at the top connecting the pillars, by the way, that's what the fillets were. We know that silver represents atonement and redemption. We found that, of course, in our last class. And it means to attach and to join. So there's something beautiful in this principle that they're all fashioned and joined together, these 60 pillars, as one body. 
They're all unified, brought together as one body. So it's important, brothers and sisters, that we're not discouraged in the fullness of understanding the pillars of wood, of shittim wood, the humility of our nature, set in sockets of brass, but unified by the pr principle of silver and redemption. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. We do look to heaven for redemption. Of the earth, we know what our nature is. We absolutely know that beyond any shadow of the doubt, brothers and sisters, of what we are. But there is hope of redemption in this process. And then we read in Acts 6, this principle of the tatches of gold that coupled the curtains. They were like little hooks or loops or pins or claps of brass or gold, depending on where they were, to draw the pieces together. And we are told twice here in verse 13 and 18 for the purpose that it might be one tabernacle. So like the tatchets of silver, or like those, uh, those rods of silver, and like these tatches or these clasps, their purpose was to draw together as one. So though there's an individual pillar and a standing of individual saints, there is a principle of unity, of unifying in the truth not unity in the flesh. There are organizations all over the world that meet for different causes and they call it unity or being united. And they even call it a united kingdom, a United States of America. They are not unified in the true principles of the truth. These are people that are drawn together by a sole principle and understanding of God manifestation. And that's what Philippians is talking about when Paul exhorts them saying, stand you fast in the one spirit, Oneness of mind in the faith. It's that one faith, one hope, one baptism, one truth. It's a unity of mind based upon a one principle of understanding. And that's the importance of the truth. It is not merely unifying as an organization. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And we didn't have time to get to this in our first class. Because the beginning of the tabernacle is John 1. The word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. But his concluding prayer in Gethsemane is that, remember, let them make me a sanctuary. I have manifested thy name among men. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I have glorified thee, says John 17. I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. That's how we're sanctified. And he prays that they may be one as he and the Father are one, that the Father is in him, he is in the Father, that we would be one with them. That's the purpose of it. That the glory which thou has given me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, thou and me. That is the purpose, brothers and sisters, of the truth. It is not for us to collect as an ecclesia to have a oneness of mind, independent from the Father and the Son. There are ecclesias that do that. They're all in agreement on how certain things should go forth. And they may not necessarily be in unison with the things of God manifestation of Yahweh and his Son. They all agree. Well, you know what? There are plenty of churches that agree on things too. So it's a matter of what Paul says in Ephesians, this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's the one body spirit called in one hope of calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all. Who is above all, through all and in you all. That's God manifestation. That's a whole different principle of unity than all men being in agreement. I covered news for many years in many city council meetings and government official meetings where they voted unanimously on something that was pure wickedness. And this is why the truth unites. For time's sake, I'm just going to leave the screen and then move on. It unites because we all principally understand what we are. We understand for what purpose we have been called. And we understand the end goal is to be conformed to the image of the Son who glorified the Father. It is all for the purpose of God manifestation. That's what unifies us. So that there 
inside those principles, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male nor female. That's how the flesh is broken down and created by the pattern of Yahweh and for his purpose. And what were the problems of the children of Israel, brothers and sisters? <clears throat> Four basic problems. Brother Roberts points them out. So does Brother Mansfield and the expositor. They looked back. They saw the difficulties, and you know what? They really preferred being in Egypt, and they said so. They complained about their temporal provision. Not that I've ever done any of these things, like I know you haven't. Complained about their temporal provision. You know, if the truth were just easier, they doubted the reality of the future, where there was really something to be attained, even when evidence of his existence was brought before their eyes by the spies, and then, of course, they were taken in by the present. Those are all things that are pitfalls for brethren in this day and age. And Yahweh deliberately, Deuteronomy 8, tells us that during this ecclesia in this wilderness and the tabernacle in the wilderness, brothers and sisters, we all, there is no temptation that is not taking you that is common unto men. There are sometimes we look back and we say, you know what, we'd have been better in the world. We complain about how life is in the truth. We doubt whether we will ever have the faith to inherit it. We're grasshoppers in their eyes, and then we're snatched by the present and the trickery of the Moabites and so on and so forth. And so that once you set inside the door, which we already mentioned, four pillars of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very first thing that you would find, brothers and sisters, which we are told is set by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, we find the altar of Shittim wood. We won't repeat again here the principle of the Shittim wood and how it was a thorn tree. You'll already draw connections, of course, with the curse upon man and the humility of man and his flesh. It's symbolic of the stature and the, stature and the countenance of men. The pride of a couple of men in scripture was brought down, hewn down like a tree. And we're told that in Daniel and Ezekiel. It represents the stately position of men hewn down and now put to his specifications. Five cubits by five cubits, four square. It was a perfect four square, brothers and sisters. So it was flesh that was hewn down, fitted for the purpose of sacrifice, lying in this position of four square. And the altar, literally the Hebrew, means to slaughter. And that is the only purpose of the flesh before Yahweh can make use of it. If the flesh is not crucified, if we love all the things about the kingdom where our eyes are cast into the most holy, and the cherubim and the glory of Yahweh and the light that's there, which only one man, went one time a year, the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven, Hebrews 9, we will never get there. The things of the kingdom sound wonderful. The people of, world, of the world would want the kingdom. Reigning in a beautified earth where they are in power? Oh, they'd love that. But the process that it takes to get to the purified gold and the immortality that is in that condition begins with the principle of upholding another's righteousness they don't want to do that. And then crucifying the flesh, which is by the door of the altar. Exodus 40, verse 29. Right there. The moment you're associated with the door, the four pillars of Christ, the association of that principle is death to the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll go no further in anything that we do in the truth. And I say this very respectfully, brothers and sisters, but I do mean it sincerely. Having come out of the world, some people in a very, very small aspect speak of the kingdom of God only in the terms of where Isaiah sets it. Where the sheep and the lion and the ox and the, the carnivorous animals will lie down all and eat straw together. And that's the only capacity of which they see the kingdom. And they almost speak of it in a term like the world speaks of it going to heaven. There are so many more aspects to the kingdom. There is a great submission of fleshly men 
and the haughtiness of pride of men to be brought low and a very slow gradual bringing back of the nation of Israel into the wilderness of the peoples and a very slow process of the humbling of the nations. It is not, if that were the only way that it described the kingdom, well, so be it, but it's not. It's the minimal aspect in which it describes the kingdom. And so our association with the door, remember this, when we're baptized, we are baptized, no substitution here, into Jesus Christ. We are crucified with him. We are buried with him in baptism. You just circle the, the, how many times that, that appears in Romans, with him into him it is he's not a man that stands aloof to us as he crucified the flesh let everyone that it follows him take up his own wood both the pillar and the building of that altar of burnt offering let him take up his own wood and follow him he is not a substitute he is an example for the rest of men. We have an altar, says Paul in Hebrews, where of those that serve the tabernacle had no right to eat. We're told he is the altar. We are told he's all the things of the tabernacle. It's not hard to identify, as we said. God manifestation is a very deep principle. It is not hard to identify. Very difficult to manifest. And of course, what was the altar? If it represents putting down flesh and its name means to slaughter, it has to be made of brass. It has to. It's not gold here. It's brass. Which, by the way, we'll get to the altar of incense. It also was four square. It's much smaller, and there's a reason for that. It's of gold. But it is also four square. Let every man's work be made manifest. It will be revealed by the fire, brothers and sisters. We've got in the Bible dictionary, the word is the inspecting fire. It's not my word of fire. It's not a hammer. It's the spirit that not a man quench the spirit. It's defined as the fire. Even the Holy Spirit came out the back in the form of a flame and the tongue of fire. It represents the Holy Spirit of the word of God in its various aspects. There it is, brothers and sisters. There is the purging. And so flesh is taken down and it's covered by a principle of brass. It is flesh, but it's flesh that God needs to work with. He needs to cover it. He needs to purify it. It's not flesh in and of itself. He has to do something with it. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters. And God willing, we'll get to this a few weeks ahead. When we get to the section of the altar offerings, there are four major altar offerings. There's a lot of offerings, four major ones, the burnt, the meal, the peace, and the sin offering. But this particular altar is not identified with any of those. It's called the altar of burnt offering. And it was called a continual burnt offering under the law. Why that one? Because in the burnt offering, the very first one given to us in Leviticus 1, we're told the head, fat, inwards, and legs were offered in that offering. And the scribe, when he comes to Christ, he even says, loving Yahweh with all the heart, understanding, soul, and strength, the head, fat, inward, and legs, is like whole burnt offerings. And Christ said, by the way, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. He understood the burnt offering in the four various pieces represented loving Yahweh with all the heart, soul, understanding, and strength. The affection, the mental, mental is very important. You can't be an ignorant Christadelphian and sacrifice fully to God. Paul declares we have to present our bodies a living sacrifice and we have to be conformed to the image of God. We have to know what our acceptable service is. This altar is called the altar of total dedication. 
Forget about the lampstand. Forget about the table of showbread. Forget about the altar of incense. Forget about the ark. Forget about the mercy seat. Forget about the cherubim. Forget about the labor. This is where it begins, brothers and sisters. If we are about maintaining our own integrity, even after baptism, we get involved with an ecclesia and they like us personally, and we know the truth is not really upheld, but we all get on fine and we all vote unanimously. This is a very individual state where individuals came to make their offerings to Yahweh. Do we serve him with everything? Do we serve him with everything? Are we willing to have the flesh totally crucified? And it was to be four square. Now we know the children of Israel and the 12 stones, it says in Exodus 28, the scripture in front of you, were embroidered in four square upon the breastplate of the high priest. It was the breastplate of judgment. You show up the 12 stones and it will be four square, it says, upon the chest of the high priest. The new Jerusalem is called the city that lieth four square. You get that from the apocalypse. You get it also from Ezekiel 42. Why? Crucifixion of the flesh is about the purpose, ultimately, hopefully, of future glorification. We will suffer first with, first with him, says Paul to Timothy by the Spirit, before you will reign with him. If anyone desires to save his life eternally, he'll lose it. In converse, what good is it if a man achieves all the things of this life, Luke, but loses in a, his own soul? It's crucifixion that we may gain life eternal. It's three cubits. Three cubits high. Why three? We talked about that. And the importance of Bible numerics. Why five cubits? Why is it five cubits square? That's the number of grace. We'll get to this, God willing, when we get to the ark where the law was inside and the mercy seat was above it. Mercy does not remove law. Paul says, by the Spirit, do we make the law void? No, we establish it. This place of sacrifice, the number five, four square, by grace, is based on the principle of sacrifice. There is no grace for people that don't crucify the flesh. Okay, I'm talking too long. I'm chewing up time. We'll get into that, God willing, we get it into the most fully. And the ark and the mercy seat. So it's three cubits, of course, representing sacrifice and resurrection. Death to the flesh that there may be resurrection. And you know the principles involved there. And there are horns apart upon it. It's where the sacrifice is bound, says the psalmist. It's also a place of mercy. You'll know in Kings, in two places, in chapter 1 of 1 Kings and in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, typical of Solomon, the greater son of David's future reign and glory, and the, you'll notice that the very beginning of his reign begins with judgment at the house of God. Then he judges between the two harlots, Aholib and Aholibah, Israel and Judah, based upon the death of the son. He brings Israel in. Then he begins to subdue the nations and build the temple and so forth. It's a perfect chronology of the setting up of the kingdom of God. Those men fled and they sought sacrifice by the horns of the altar. And you know what? They didn't find grace upon that five cubit cornered altar because they were not men of mercy. Yahweh extends mercy, as all those references at the bottom tell you, to those that keep and obey his commandments. Joab was not that man. Adonijah was not that man. There are certain men that want mercy when the kingdom is established and they've done anything but obey the principles of God during their time of probation. Why four corners? Four corners. Because it represents mercy of which they tried to hold of. 
take hold of because we talked about this before. Israel was scattered into the four corners of the earth. You get it there in Isaiah. You get it, of course, again in Acts and in Matthew 24. It's God's people and his elect scattered from the four corners of the earth, which is how the truth went to the Gentiles. It's an altar of burnt offering, offering means of grace by sacrifice to all kindred tongues and peoples and nations. They will come from the east, west, north, and south and sit down in the kingdom of God, Luke 13, when Christ said to the Jews, and ye yourselves shall be cast out. It's a hope for all people, brothers and sisters. Thou shalt make pans. Nope, there are five of them. Shovels, basins, flesh hooks, fire pans. Again, the number five. Five animals could be sacrificed upon it. Bullock, sheep, goat, pigeon, dove. There is a principle of grace associated with sacrifice and crucifying in the flesh. And we know that the vessel is used to represent the saints. They're accommodating vessels for the altar. We have an altar they have no right to eat of. The altar is Christ. These are accompanying vessels to the altar. And that's us, brothers and sisters. And we also know the truth of the bottom quote in 2 Timothy. In a great house, in an ecclesia, we know. We're one of the few honest group of people that even claim to know the Bible, that admit that every member of our community will not inherit life eternal. You can't really get the once saved, always saved Baptist and Catholics and all those people to admit that because they don't believe it. We know that in a house, there are some vessels of honor and some to dishonor, some that are not meet for the master's use and some that are. Thou shall make a great network of brass, four brazen rings upon the four corners of it. Here again is that principle of brass. And we know where they got this. We know where we, they got this covering. They got it from the censers of the sinners of Kor, Dathan, and Myra. Not Myra. Do we know where they got it? They got it from number 16. Eliezer, the high priest, took the brazen censers of these sinners as a sign where they had burned and offered... And he made broad plates for the covering of the altar to be a covering for the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel. That was the sign. We know where it came from. So again, it's identified with the censors of these sinners. So here again is that principle of brass in motion. Very simple principle, but we've talked about. And it's interesting that the atonement for this altar takes place during a period seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar it says in chapter 29 to sanctify it and whosoever identifies touches the altar will be holy at length i could tell you what brother robert says in law of moses but it's pretty lengthy here's what brother hp mansfield says in the expositor all who touch the altar, Hebrews 13, it's Christ, were holy, were made holy. In its antitype, all who make contact with Christ through baptism, crucifying of the flesh, are constituted holy. We are not holy. We are brass. We are unclean. The flesh has got to be crucified. It is touching the altar. It is identifying with the principle that is holy. It's not as if we argue with some of the things that Christ said or did or his works. Now, maybe that was righteous. Or try to impute our thinking on him. Well, he thought just like we did. No, he did not think like we did. He shared our nature. Let the mind that was in Christ be in you. His thinking was the thinking of the heavenly father. It was not our thinking. It was filled with the spirit mind. He was the word made flesh. And we understand this seven day period, the whole principles of redemption found in 
the altar. Here's the law of Moses. It tells us that a sinful man, even with the utmost docility of spiritual circumcision, desiring to come within the walls of righteousness, cannot approach God acceptably except by sacrifice. The truth is that man, as he is now, is separated from God. He cannot return except in the way of God's appointment. And he must perish apart from that way. No truth is more clean, clearly visible than that. As we gaze upon the tabernacle, standing inside its contained enclosure of linen, men think God is bound to save them if they are good. As the popular phrase runs, they forget that they are sinners in a state of alienation from him. Note that because they're sinners ending in death, which he alone can terminate. They forget that God made man for his own objects and that he will save them for no other. They altogether fail to realize the relative positions of God and man. It starts, and remember what Brother Robert says there. They've now entered in, not outside. They've now entered into the place that is just inside the door of the white linen righteousness, held up by 60 pillars who were set in sockets of brass, looking for redemption in rods at the top of silver. These are people that understand what they are, that flesh has got to be cut down, that we have to identify and associate with the altar, that we have to look for redemption, and that it's all about the principle of God manifestation. Like I said, there are many details to the tabernacle, and the doctrines parabolically expressed through all the history of Scripture and all the aspects spoken by Christ, whether past, present, or future, relate to the kingdom of God. This one is about God manifestation. It's a big principle full of little details. The little details are not hard to find. And we have them in the four works of Brother Roberts from the 1800s and in many ways in the mid 1900s or 1970s by Brother H. Bill in the Expositor. And then we step inside. Sorry, we're running a little late. Thou shalt make a laver of brass, his foot also of brass, to wash withal. Now, this is one of those objects, brothers and sisters. We don't even have to guess what it means. We're literally told in the New Testament that husbands are supposed to wash their wives with the water of the word. That phrase, water of the word, is literally the Greek equivalent for labor. So we're not guessing here. So the purifying process does not end at baptism. And I said this to my daughters both of which we're very thankful for, were baptized when they were late teenagers. This did not be end their walk in the truth. And there, as you know, there's a lot of study of the first principles to go up when there's like 400 and some questions that go into baptism and a good confession of faith. This is not the end of your cramming and your study for the principles of God. This is the beginning of it. We purify ourselves by obeying the truth. We don't get baptized unless we doctrinally understand these things. It's the perpetual washing, and it's called the washing of the regeneration by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Brother Thomas says this in Elpis Israel, there is no such thing as the renewal of an ignorant man. No such thing. You can't be born again and be an ignorant man. I hear again the word washing in the regeneration, you're born again by the principles of the truth. It's the word labor. How will a man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. And this labor, we're told in Exodus 38, was made by the looking glasses provided by the women. It was a mirror. If we want to know what we are, and I still believe this to this day, and I know I've said it in previous classes, you go back, back to John chapter 3. At its core, it's why the people of the world and Christadelphians avoid study of the Bible. We are talking about a lot of prophetic parables. 
and the things of the Old Testament by type and allegory. If you just ran theme studies on the morality of the Bible, it would peel you over. It, you don't even have to talk about the things that we're talking about here. There is a reason that people avoid study of the scriptures. How am I supposed to raise my children? How am I supposed to act toward the world? Just do studies on that. They're not embedded in parables or types or allegories. There's a reason people avoid them. Because it's a mirror that's going to tell us how to live. Cleanse your hands. He washed his feet and his hands. It's the work of the hands and it's the walk of the feet. You know how those phrase appears in the Bible. It's what we do in daily life. It's the sanctification that comes from the truth. And what does James say? You know, people that just study it academically, they're like someone that built. They study the word, the perfect law of liberty. They think that now the word of grace of Christ has given them liberty to live how they want. They're like beholding themselves and their face in a mirror. And straightway, they go and they forget what manner of man they are. That doesn't matter how I sin, Christ will cover it. Here's Brother Roberts again in the law of Moses. After the altar, the sacrifice, Washing, purification, making clean, there is no accidental order of events. And you know, in our introductory classes, we emphasize chronological order of things. And again, we've got to get uh, Uncle Colin Hollenby to do some studies in the um, signs of John. There is a beautiful chronology to the signs of John. There's a reason they're given in those orders. It is not enough to have God's righteousness declared in sacrifice and endorsed in our baptism into the death of Christ. It's wonderful. We have to wash in the labor. We have to conform to the exhortation, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings. Literally, this is done by subjecting the mind to the influence of the word of God. It's cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit of the mind. And there's a lot of filth that goes on in my own mind, brothers and sisters, and I know I have to be cleansed. And here it is. It's the washing of the hands of Aaron and his sons and, his, and, and their hands and their feet. And again, you can find the quote. You'll find the corresponding to this in Hebrews. I've got to move a little bit for time here, brothers and sisters. You'll know that Aaron, the high priest, and his sons and his brethren represent Christ and the saints. Very simple. You'll get this from the corresponding uh, references in the book of Hebrews. And that we're begotten by the word, but we have got to grow, nurtured with the milk of the first principles, and then going on to the meat. It's not enough just to know the doctrines of basic fundamentals. You've got to grow on that. And that's what Hebrews 5 says, because it rolls over into Hebrews and 6 and says, we, six and says we've, got, we've got to go beyond the doctrine of baptisms. The laying on of hands and so on and so forth. You got to grow beyond, okay, we don't go to heaven when we die. We know the resurrection of the dead. We know the nature of man. You've got to build principles deeper than that. And both the times where that appears in scripture, and that is Hebrews 5 and 1 Corinthians 3. And you can check me on this, brothers and sisters. He's rebuking the brethren because they have not grown from milk. He's rebuking them. So they wash their hands and their feet. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from all my iniquity. And that's the beauty of the scriptures. That's what 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 says. He is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess and forsake. We have to believe that he does have that ability to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess it. The borders of that process, brothers and sisters... Begin in baptism, five cubits, four square. It's a principle of grace, three cubits high by a principle of identifying with his son. And do you know something about the labor? There are no specifications given to its size. We're not told it's four cubits. We're not told it's two cubits. We're not told it's 175 cubits. There's no measurement given to it. Because it's able to cleanse from all unrighteousness. I'll say this very quickly before the quote from H.P. Mansfield. Brethren like to say in a negative way, well, there's no sin recorded of a saint of God that isn't somewhere in the Bible. It doesn't matter the murder, the unfaithfulness, the improprieties. It's more than that, brothers and sisters. 
There's not one of those sins that isn't a tongue for in the scriptures. Whether it's infidelity, whether it's murder, whether it's killing, as he says, I'm the least. I'm the filth and scourge of the earth. I'm the worst among men. But I am what I am. God saw fit to make me an apostle. The word of God makes baptism valid. It's confirming baptism. The priest washed at the laver both before and after attending to the altar of sacrifice. The antitype is revealed in the influence and the need for the word both before baptism, making contact with Christ in the altar, then after baptism, walking in the holy place in our course of daily life. So the labor will be of brass, and look where it's put. It's put between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. That's the location. Before we get to the place where the lampstand is, before we get to the place where the table of showbread is, And I will say this, brothers and sisters, because I've said it many times privately. A lot of times brethren will say, and I know what they mean in good intention. Someone that's been away, they say away for the meeting for months and months and months. They just need to get back to the meeting. Is that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians? Being a little concerned that leaven will infect the whole lump? What does that mean? If they're not washing themselves in the labor, if they're not crucifying their flesh, there's no golden gem at the ecclesia that's going to take place. It was put between the altar of personal sacrifice, the place of personal washing, then where the lampstand is, then where the table of showbread is. There's accountability, brothers and sisters, when we show to partake of the emblems. When we enter into the ecclesia, there is a protocol, there is a decorum to follow. And it's supposed to be a manifestation of the sincerity and genuineness of our personal life of baptism and personal washing in the word. I know what brethren mean when they say it genuinely. But I think there needs to be a little more thought in that. All they need to do is come back to the meeting. No, they need to start living the truth first. They need to start doing the readings. They need to start studying. Coming back to the Ecclesias, far past that, really. And so that's how we'll conclude this cast, class, brothers and sisters. And I'm sorry, we went about four minutes over. But we did lose connection for a minute. So that's how I'm going to justify it completely in brass and justification of the flesh. Thank you, brethren. And God willing, next time we'll take up the elements of the holy place where we get into uh, the element of the table of show and uh, the lampstand and whatnot. Thank you, brother.